Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're not all present here, but I think we should get started so that we can keep on time. I'm uh, Laurel Evans. I'm a program planning lawyer with the Law Society's Continuing Legal Education Department. I'd like to welcome you uh, to today's program, Adding Injury to Insult. I'd like to begin by taking this opportunity to thank today's faculty uh, for their time in coming to speak to you today and also for the time and effort that they put into preparing the extensive materials which are in your binders. As you may be aware, CLE is a nonprofit arm of the Law Society and we rely upon the generosity of faculty such as today's for their voluntary time and effort in presenting these programs to you. I'd like now to uh, introduce you to the co-chairs of uh, this afternoon's program, Ms. V Vicki Russell and Mr. David Potts. <clears throat> Vicki Russell is um, a graduate from Queen's Law School and she articled with Fraser and Beattie. She has an undergraduate degree in communications arts and has spent a great deal of uh, her career combining the law and the media. Ms. Russell was in a senior capacity at CBC as legal correspondent for CBC National News for nine years. Her work in profiling the law has been seen on News World, where she produced a half-hour show on the law, and she was an on-air live host of the Kennedy Smith uh, trial. Prior to her work on television, Ms. Russell had a radio spot on CBC Radio, which was syndicated on five stations in Ontario. Ms. Russell has written magazine articles on the law and is a contributing author of a text on law to undergraduate students, and she is naturally a frequent public speaker. David Potts's practice is confined to civil and criminal litigation with an emphasis on libel law. He practices at the firm of Lang Michener, which unfortunately is um, uh, missing from his CV, so please add that in. Uh, Mr. Potts has conducted libel actions for defendants and plaintiffs in media and non-media libel actions. He is uh, co-author of uh, the text uh, Canadian Libel Practice, published by Butterworth, uh, the other co-author being Mr. Porter, who is also a speaker here today. He is Canadian contributor to the IBA Media Law Newsletter and the Australian Media Law Newsletter. David is also a member of the Ontario Attorney General's Advisory Committee on the Law of Defamation. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to David Potts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh Welcome everybody. I'd like to uh, uh, spike one possible criticism. As you'll see from the materials, this seminar could have been held in 1894 as opposed to 1994. The subject matter deals almost exclusively with uh, print media actions. That's uh, not by accident. We simply did not have enough time, but we thought we'd try to remedy that, that uh, uh, defect. And you'll find at the back of the materials some uh, uh, articles and uh, uh, both in newspapers and, and in uh, academic journals dealing with uh, electronic mail, internet, and uh, uh, some procedural concerns in, in broadcast actions. These are not science fiction matters. They really are going to be part of our practice, and uh, I think it's going to be a fascinating uh, area to, to deal with. There's very little guidance now, and I hope uh, some of the materials in the back <coughs> will uh, at least uh, spark your imagination in thinking about uh, uh, some, some of the new problems. Now, my uh, uh, role in, the, in the, uh, this seminar is, is to act as moderator on the, on the panel about pleadings, motions, and, and discovery. And we gave considerable thought about how we, would, how we would do this, and there's really two questions we wanted to uh, try to address. The first is, what info would be most information would be most useful, and we felt uh, information about uh, strategy, uh, tactics, and and procedure. So there won't be anything on substantive law. And secondly, we felt a question: what should the uh, what should the approach be? And we felt that you might like to get some sense of it from the plaintiff's point of view, but more importantly, <coughs> what we've decided is is to give you an opportunity to hear the perspective of, uh, from defendant's counsel. And we're very fortunate today to have, uh, and I'll embarrass them slightly, I think three of the best in the country, and you'll have an opportunity to, to ask questions and to hear about some of their uh, strategies and tactics and, and, and concerns. They've had a unique blend of experience, not just in defending libel actions, but in doing pre-publication review, contempt proceedings, and. Uh, and, and charter applications. 
Most of them have handled dozens, if not hundreds, of, of actions and, and are very experienced. So I think uh, I'd like to introduce them quite briefly. We have on my immediate left, I have Rick Dearden, who acts for the Ottawa Citizen, Southam News Service, and the Brockville Recorder and Times, and has appeared in the Supreme Court of Canada on several occasions on behalf of the Centre for Investigative Journalism. Uh, on my immediate right, I have uh, Carol McCall, who is, uh, acts for the Globe and Mail and the Report on Business Magazine, and on my far right, uh, I have Brian Rogers, who is, acts for the Toronto Star, uh, Metroland, uh, the Hamilton Spectator, uh, Kingston Whig Standard, and the Canadian Lawyer. I wanted to indicate some of the clients because you get an idea of the range of their of their experience and uh, uh, exposure to different different uh, different problems. So what I propose to do is is give you now uh, a brief outline of of some of the points that that I feel you may want to consider when you're answering that first question, should you sue? And this is, by definition, it's idiosyncratic and personal, and, and, uh, but I hope it, it, it will provide you with some assistance. The first question I always ask is, really, what is the sting of the libel? And is it simple? And can you make it simple? And is it indefensible? If it's not simple and indefensible, you really, ought to think about not proceeding. You should spend a considerable amount of time at the first interview and really determine uh, if, if there's a possibility of a defensive justification uh, proceed. A technique that I use and I ask clients to use is to, is to uh, take the, the, the article, and since we're dealing with a print media now, take the article and to go through it paragraph by paragraph and have a checklist of what they complain about in each paragraph and what they say their evidence uh, and what uh, what their evidence would be and what they, they say is, 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 is correct. So you have them do this analysis right at the beginning. It forces people to collect their thoughts and, 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 and hopefully dispel some of the blur which often descends upon somebody when, when they are attacked in, in, the, in the media. And then the next question, I, I like them to ask themselves is really what's the impact on them? Because even if it has been a terrible libel, if it hasn't had an impact on them, you may really want to think uh, twice uh, about whether you want to proceed. Find out what the reaction of friends, colleagues, and business. And it's very important that they that they record this information uh, as as uh, in as detailed fashion as possible right from the beginning. Because if you wait. Uh, memories are frail and, and you'll have lost that, that essential information which will really put some color and some detail to the, uh, when, when you're actually at, at the trial. And the next question, and it may be obvious, but I always ask it is, what's the objective? Why do you want to sue? And, and if it's anything other than vindication of reputation, then you should really tell them to forget about it. And fifth, I always try to see if it's part of an overall strategy because rarely do I find that libel actions are, occur in the abstract. They're either part of a, ba a corporate battle, there may be criminal proceedings that rise, there may be connected with labor disputes, they're, they're usually connected in some uh, other, other, other dispute and you need to make sure that the, the, the libel tale in many cases doesn't wag the, whatever, the other, whatever the dog is and it's very important to, to keep that in, in, in perspective. So the, the last issue that I, I try to address is question of optics or appearance. And I look at how will it appear? And then I ask them, do, does it matter how will it appear? And it's, it's per, because by definition, this action is involving reputation. And it may be pretty hollow if, they're, if, they, if they win in a court and, and they're uh, uh, pilloried in the community. And you need to ask them whether this struggle or this lawsuit will be perceived as a, as a fight between a David and Goliath, whether they'll be perceived as being bullies or just trying to stifle freedom of speech. It may not matter to them, but at least you ask the questions and then, and then they know what they're getting into. So there's no surprises when, when, the, when the trial goes, goes on. Because you remember, a libel action is fought in two arenas. One, the, the, the courtroom and also the arena of public opinion. You may also want to consider other possible remedies, and I'll just 
quickly gallop through them. The first is slander of goods, and the second is, uh, uh, which has just recently come up, is, is the possible action for negligent misstatement uh, as, as set out by the recent House of Lords decision in Spring versus Guardian Assurance. And that, I think, provides an opportunity for Creative Council to use that, that particular cause of action uh, where there, there was no, or the, there was a defense in the form of, of, of qualified privilege. Now I'll just move to uh, the notices, uh, or, or sorry, one last matter is injunctions. Quite simply, they're difficult to get and they backfire. And I just give you examples of the, the, the Friedland case and the situation involving Lindquist Homes. Uh, and in both those cases, the ultimate result I would uh, submit was, uh, was not achieved, which was to, to, uh, to keep the name out, out of the view of the, of, of the press. So you have to really look at, even if you've got a good case for an injunction, what will this, do, will this just bring unwarranted attention to your client? The next, uh, from the plaintiff's point of view, is the notice. Aside from uh, meeting the statutory requirements, you, you should consider several factors. Framing your innuendo at the particular right with the with the notice. Sometimes you might want to ask for an apology, although the statute obviously deals with 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 that. But you may want to send the apology with it. And uh, a third feature, and this is uh, it may may vary from the particular case, but you may find it's counterproductive to demand costs and damages at that particular stage. You really want to to appear and be show that that your only objective is is the vindication of your reputation, and it's not to seek uh, money. Now, at this stage, I'm going to turn it to uh, over to Carol McCall uh, from Patterson McDougall, and and she will uh, take the position of the D defendants counsel when they receive the notice and uh, and give her comments about uh, about what normally occurs. Well, as <coughs> David pointed out, the uh, the notice is a, the key initiating document in a libel action against uh, a media defendant or against any other defendant where the publication has been in a media form. One of the omissions from the material which is included in your binder is a reference to a case called Stewart uh, Furniture, which uh, clarifies that even if the me defendant being su sued is not a media defendant, if the publication of the libel occurred in a media, the Stewart Furniture case being uh, an advertisement, notice should be given in the usual course. I want to clarify with you, David. Was there any media defendant in that case, or was it just the uh, the advertiser? Uh, ultimately, there wasn't. Uh, but by the time we got it, no, it was just the advertiser. It was just the advertiser, yeah. so it was a, a clean issue in that sense. Yeah. Uh, failure to um, properly design and set out the notice can result in the loss of your cause of action for your client. So it is it's important to direct the amount of attention that David said at that stage to the document. Uh, from a, a media perspective, the response uh, generated by that document uh, occurs in any event, but the better set out the information is, the more detail you provide, ideally uh, accompanying with a letter that sets out in, in even further detail exactly what it is your client's complaining about uh, with respect to the publication, assists uh, a media defendant in responding to it. Uh, if the purpose is truly vindication of a reputation, it's at this stage, ideally, you would like for your client to have an apology, ideally, plus a retraction, uh, uh, certainly, in the uh, published in the newspaper in fairly short order. Uh, a defendant finds it very difficult to respond without any information to deal with. Uh, if, if it's an article, for example, that has been a result of uh, an investigative report of some sort, typically the reporter has already gone through all the information, put together their story, it's been reviewed with the uh, editors involved, uh, it's been lawyered. So in that sense, there's a feeling that the article fairly sets out whatever the situation described is. When the notice comes in, it has to address what's wrong with the article to evoke a response. Otherwise, the response would just be going through the complaint to see if it was covered off in the material that was reviewed from the article, for the article in the first place. That's it for the notice. Any other points you can think of on the notice? No, that's, I think that's enough for the, for the notice. The statement of claim now, what I'd like to just deal with is just two or three issues. The, 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 and really the most important one, I believe, is the pleading of the defamatory meaning. Uh, 
quite briefly, defamatory meanings can have three manifestations or three forms, and it's first something that's just a natural and ordinary meaning, which is just clear on its face. Secondly, there's there is a term called a false innuendo, which is in effect an inferential meaning, and this should be pleaded. And third, there is a, a, a meaning called a legal innuendo, and that's a situation where the, it's only defamatory in the uh, existence of extrinsic facts. Uh, uh, for example, several years ago when we weren't allowed to advertise, if you had said a lawyer uh, was one of the best advertisers in the, in the country, that would have been prof uh, an allegation of, uh, of, of professional misconduct. To, to the outside public, that wouldn't have seemed defamatory at all. So the, the way you would have pleaded it is, is the extrinsic facts would have been the rules that you would plead from, or from the law society that showed that that, was, uh, that that particular allegation was defamatory in the presence of those extrinsic facts. And they're usually used in, in those sort of situations or if a foreign language is, is, is being used. And uh, the only things I'd like to say about, fall, about innuendos is that really three things is keep them simple, make sure they're not superfluous, and make sure they're indefensible. And I'd like to get the panel's reaction to this particular point of the, of the pleading of the false innuendos because they see them all the time and uh, some they meet, greet with glee and some they meet with other reactions. So, but Carol? Uh, it could be an interesting exercise. The, uh, a very recent decision early this week in the court resulted from a false innuendo plea that wasn't properly supported by the facts in the article or the words set out in the article. And although in a statement of defense, a typical defendant pleads that the words aren't capable of bearing the meaning, uh, that can be, in a sense, a sleeping plea if you ignore it. Uh, typically, the defendant will remind you of it. You may even have a motion on it. But in this particular case, although the plaintiff was well aware of that position being taken, the point was argued at the opening of trial, and the action was dismissed. So the, how one characterizes the false innuendo is, is key. Uh, it's probably worthwhile in your office even, you're looking at it deciding what it might mean, canvas some of your partners because from a defense point of view, that's one of the things that we do internally in, in terms of defending, like what do the words in this article mean? What do you actually get out of it when you read it? What's the sting of it? Uh, because essentially that's the question that you'll be addressing to the judge if it goes to that point or the jury ultimately down the line. Brian, do you have any observations on that? No, I, I, I agree totally with what Carol had to say. and. Uh, and it, and it is the case on occasion that you see a string of false innuendos put forward, half of which don't really bear any relationship to the words that are complained of. Um, they're a strained, far distant planet that is being described. Uh, and those are the cases that, uh, that lead to the kinds of problems Carol described. Because sometimes you can lose the case right in the pleadings because then the, then the defense can then uh, put in particulars of justification to plea to support that particular plea and then they ultimately can substantially justify it and, and if not win the case uh, uh, at least reduce damages to such a nominal level that it's not worth proceeding. So it, it's really, it is, it is critical. Carol? And just to clarify, in, in the case I referred to, the judge did give leave to amend even though the motion was brought at trial and the, defense, the plaintiff now has 15 days to, to re-plead essentially and it will be re-defended and go to discovery for whatever's necessary. Um, our guess was that the, the judge was being very kind in the circumstance, but it's, it's nice to hear it happen and not turn into an E&O claim anyway. Do you have any other observations on the, on the, on the, on the pleadings from the, that you look at? Uh, with respect to addressing false innuendos? No, oh. from, from some of the other from, matters. Well, generally, the, the approach in, in looking at the statement of defense is essentially tie it back into the notice of libel to see if you have been given notice of all the matters that have been complained of um, prior to them appearing in the statement of defense. And then uh, essentially working through it to see what your defenses are going to be. If you have multiple false innuendos pleaded, there may be different defenses available to some of them. Uh, ideally, if you approach the pleading you focused it and there's essentially one key false innuendo that you're relying on and it may be elaborated a bit in other little details. Uh, then your consideration is how you're going to uh, address it. Is there a defense available? Um, can you argue that um, 
there's some sort of a privileged occasion that applies to the publication so that uh, you shouldn't be responsible even though there's some error in the, uh, the facts set out in the article. Uh, they're essentially listed in the libel and slander act as far as the media is concerned. And then there are numerous, numerous other qualified privileged common law defenses that have to do with duty and interest. But you look through that examination uh, initially. You also, of course, look at the, at the issue of whether you can prove the truth of the, uh, the false innuendo. Um, one defense that we, as defense lawyers, would like to plead is turning the case around and turning it into our case as opposed to the plaintiff's case. Uh, the Pauli Peck decision in, the, uh, in England um, permitted that from a defense point of view where we could plead our own innuendos uh, that were defamatory and then proceed to justify them. Uh, unfortunately, in Ontario, the Turner case has uh, said, at least at the, at the first level um, of appeal, that that type of pleading is not appropriate. Um, I think you will continue to see defense lawyers still trying to use that plea uh, in the hope that eventually we will be able to defend the article that, in our view, was written in the first place. Maybe you could expand on that just a bit. In, in um, typically the, the concept, as in all your other civil lit litigation matters, is that the, the plaintiff structures the case that they want to present. In libel, it becomes even more important because you set out the meaning that you want for the, wor for the words that you're complaining of in the article. Uh, classically, the defenses available were the words are incapable of bearing that meaning, the words will not be understood to bear that meaning, and alternatively, that meaning is true. So you couldn't sort of say the words bore some other meaning, and I'm seeking to justify that meaning. In Pauli Peck, uh, the, the English case, the court, in fact, permitted the defendant to plead their own lesser defamatory meaning, so-called, and then to proceed to set out the basis on which that meaning would be proven true or justified. And this is a huge, was a hugely important development for defendants uh, and in very complicated articles because, as Carol said, you could, you could shift the whole focus of the case and it could just become like two ships passing in the night and you could... Uh, because you might have a whole bunch of evidence to support one particular meaning that, uh, that they weren't looking at. So it was, it really was of considerable importance and, uh, and that's why it's a, it's a bit of a blow to defendants, the, this decision in, in, in Turner, which uh, reverts back to the old law, which is, as Carol and stated. In fairness, in the, the Turner case uh, went to appeal, <clears throat> but the case in its entirety was settled before the appeal could be heard. And unfortunately, another one hasn't <clears throat> worked its way up the ladder since. But it, it's not just sort of who gets to choose the ground. <clears throat> another way of looking at it is the plaintiff should only be compensated for damage to the reputation he actually has and deserves. And if, in fact, you can show uh, that a number of the allegations in the story and your meanings taken from the words in the story are true, then why should the plaintiff get compensated as if he had a perfectly blameless, spotless reputation? So that's another way of looking at this issue. It's a really, a, in a sense, a policy issue. And in, in Canada, obviously, the Charter of Rights uh, in applying the common law will, will play a factor. I, I don't think we've seen the end of that one yet. The other one we haven't seen an end of yet is the, uh, the so-called charter defense, you'll see it pleaded regularly in any case where you're re representing a, a plaintiff who can fall into any category of sort of public being. And uh, it's generally pleaded in the, the broadest sense of the U.S. experience, but to date we don't have uh, a lot of support for it as in jurisprudence in Canada. But just this past uh, week in Australia, the Supreme Court there adopted what we would call a modified Sullivan New York Times type of a defense uh, in that case involving a, a political figure and it's, it's essentially taking the freedom of expression to permit the, uh, the media and any other member of, of society to speak freely about uh, a politician in a manner that may well be defamatory but that is uh, protected by a privilege if it's without malice and there's some reasonable basis for, uh, for having uh, the belief. The Australian case is quite thick. I haven't digested it. Uh, from the editorials that my partner brought back from New Zealand, it would appear that the onus of proof is, still on, is on the defendant in New Zealand to establish the defense. 
but it certainly goes a long way to where we'd like as defendants to uh, to see the law in Canada on that Rick particular had, uh, point. Sorry, uh, Rick Dearden has a few observations. He was the count, uh, a co-counsel in the in the for the Ottawa citizen in the coach case, and uh, they raised that uh, that argument. The the, the uh, section two B New York Times and Sullivan argument was argued uh, at the trial division level in Nova Scotia and rejected. Uh, the Church of Scientology just got leave of the Supreme Court of Canada last week where they may or may not deal with that issue. Um, the point I would make on the need, uh, uh, and obviously I'm biased in this representing media, but I think the Coates case uh, um, just really cries out as to the need uh, for some form of qualified privilege when at least you're dealing with politicians and you're criticizing their official conduct while they're on official duty as opposed to whether they're doing something in their spare time that, that uh, may not meet the public standard, whatever that might be. But let's just assume it's public official, pub, public ofi or official duties and there was wrongdoing. Uh, we face so many hurdles in that case on Crown immunity from discovery. Uh, we were going to face Canada Evidence Act certificates. Uh, uh, I mean, it's okay to say, go ahead, media, the onus is on you to prove the truth of what you just said, but to throw up uh, obstructionist walls um, which were thrown up by the Prime Minister's office uh, to, to make sure that we didn't find out what in fact went on and whether uh, they did consider that uh, it may have posed a security risk to take off in the middle of the night from their security guards uh, uh, clear across the town of Lar to a strip club um, uh, and whether indeed he was fired or uh, resigned voluntarily so he could sue the citizen. I, I think, uh, you know, we, we should at least be entitled to get at that evidence and uh, we weren't allowed to and the case settled, was appealed to the Court of Appeal and then it settled uh, um, and we never did deal with the issue but the, the Supreme Court may deal with it in Church of Scientology. Carol, uh, you had another issue, a couple of issues on the pleadings? Uh, just to move on to, uh, to damages, the, the typical claim now comes in, in with the usual claim for general, <coughs> aggravated and punitive damages. Um, on occasion, a actual or special damages are also claimed. Um, you should be careful when claiming special damages if you have a client who probably hasn't suffered very many um, in any sense at all anyway, because it does open them to producing all kinds of uh, books and records and financial information that your client may well want to keep confidential. Uh, it is a, a claim that can be abandoned at a later point to avert that, but it's something to keep in mind with a, a sensitive plaintiff. Um, from a defense point of view, we really don't like to see punitive damages claimed because it puts into issue malice, which otherwise we might be able to avoid in our pleading in a statement of defense, which again broadens the area of discovery. Uh, I think it was one of the cases from your office, David, where we, we used to traditionally try to uh, prevent disclosure of any reporter's notes or, uh, and of course, sources. And that at one time could be fairly cleverly done by the way you pleaded the action. But with uh, the way the the, uh, the approach being taken to production and its broadening scope, uh, one doesn't usually achieve quite the objective one wants because malice seems to keep put everything on the table these days. Thank you, Carol. I'm going to turn it now to uh, over to Rick Dearden, who will deal with discovery. And I should warn you, if you're dealing with him, he sent one of his uh, adversary's clients to the hospital after four days of, of discovery. No one was the basilisk with the stare. Okay. It was one day. <laughs> And he checked himself in. I didn't do it. Uh, before I talk about discoveries, uh, um, the panel is dealing with pretrial pointers. And can I make this point? I think a critical decision you have to make, whether you're representing a plaintiff or a defendant in a libel action, is whether you act as counsel on that case. And I'll give you an example. I got a phone call yesterday, and I, I get these phone calls regularly. I don't know if my colleagues get them, but you'll get a, a counsel. Uh, in, you know, from Ottawa who phone you up and say, I hear you, you know something about libel, and you say, well, I know a bit. And uh, this guy starts talking to me, uh, trying to pick my brain for free to, to help him out in a libel action he's involved in, and he doesn't know the difference between libel and slander. He thinks they're the same thing. He thinks defamation is different from libel and slander. This is scary, that they, they've gone to discoveries. 
Uh, I said to the guy, you know, this is a slander case, and actually it's a slander of title case. Have you pleaded that? No. You plead interference with contractual relations and what happened here? No. Like, he doesn't even know what the terms mean. And it's not uncommon to get people, usually from the plaintiff's side, to phone up and pick, pick our brains um, in an area that's extremely complex, extremely technical, full of lawyer pitfalls, like notification of the Law Society of negligence type of pitfalls. So I'd say the first question you should ask yourself is, am I competent to do this for a plaintiff or a defendant, okay? Um, now, we, you've got our, uh, our pointers uh, lists uh, uh, in the materials, and mine have been primarily, uh, the, the material you got before you is from a defendant's perspective, but let me tell you first what uh, defendants seek from the plaintiff. Uh, as a general comment, as, as, and David wasn't joking, I really did in, in, on this, the morning of a, what was supposed to be a second day of discovery, have uh, counsel on the other side phone up and say they weren't coming because the guy checked him in the himself into the hospital that night because of the stress of, of the examination. It's an emotional experience. You're reliving this stuff. By the time you get to the discovery stage, you know, things have cooled down. Uh, there, certainly plaintiffs are awfully upset and mad uh, initially in the six-week period you have to decide to issue the notice. But by the time we get to examinations, uh, things have, you know, time heals uh, a little bit anyway. And he's got to know how unpleasant it's going to be to relive uh, what was alleged against him. And he, you have to tell him, and as David was mentioned, prepare him for what, what they're up against, uh, uh, that if the media, if, if we're talking the ma mainstream media, have taken it to examination for discovery, the decision's been made as a general rule that this thing's going to be defended. You will look at the notice of libel. As soon as you issue a notice of libel, the, 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 the media will send it to their lawyers. Lawyers notify the insurance company's lawyers. Uh, an assessment of, is made as to whether you have the proof uh, to back up what was said. And, and you will, believe it or not, be able to settle a lot of cases uh, uh, if, if you've got a case. So don't exaggerate uh, um, about what, what you've done, the big bad media have done uh, to, to your client. I mean, as David mentioned, you've got to remember what interests are at stake here. And the primary interest isn't money, it's, his, it's your client's reputation and credibility. And if that's what you're trying to do here, then you want something in the paper quick after the date of publication. And you don't get that by writing off uh, three-page notices of libel, um, claiming the moon and claiming what a bunch of raving idiots and, and negligent uh, SOBs uh, the, the particular newspaper is, okay? So keep that in mind as a general comment about how unpleasant it can be when you're at the discovery stage and, you, and your, uh, your client should know that. What are we looking for? Well, of course, we're going to test every one of the stings that are in the notice of libel and in the statement of claim. We're, we're going to test the validity of uh, the allegations the plaintiff's making about how they're false and how, how uh, indeed that they have injured, uh, th those words have injured uh, the reputation of, of the plaintiff. Uh, so so that, that's reliving it again, uh, but, but certainly you're going to get into a lot of evidentiary issues and, and you we're looking for his side of the story and we're testing uh, the plaintiff's side of the story. That's what we're looking for. Damages. Uh, don't exaggerate, uh, um, you know, damages are pre presumed in libel actions, but um, I think what you were suggesting, David, is if you can't show uh, the, the neighbors coming to the door um, or, or shunning completely, not coming to the door, but shunning completely uh, uh, the guy who has been libeled, uh, um, it may not be worthy of pursuing it uh, all the way to a jury uh, trial. Uh, but, but I've had a plaintiff actually swear that he was spit on a thousand times. And I, I thought he was just using it as an expression, so I said, well, do you have a name of somebody uh, who's been spit on? And, and uh, no, and I, I kept on questioning him about all these people that spit on him and realized that he's serious, he's serious, he's saying a thousand people spit on him. And I locked him into that. Well, a thousand people didn't spit on him. And I think, uh, as you see in the paper, Optics to me in a jury, uh, especially a libel action, are pretty important because it's somewhat like theater, uh, both the counsel and the witnesses on. If a plaintiff is before a jury and, to, and uh, you've locked him in on discovery to say that a thousand people spit on him because of the article, they may not believe him totally about other things he's saying, uh, um, and, and that can hurt. Uh, so 
getting to uh, the, the, the pointers that we've got there, I think optics are very important in libel actions. Juries don't really want to listen to New York Times and Sullivan arguments and qualified privilege arguments and uh, fair comment arguments and all that. They're going to look at, were you guys fair? Was the story balanced? Uh, you know, did the reporter have a mindset? This is the type of stuff you want to be exploring. How much time do I have? Lots. Lots. Good. Uh, you, you, want to, you want to know that. We ask those questions of the reporter once we get the notice. We want to know that it's fair and balanced, okay? If it, it you know, the plaintiff's uh, side of the story is, is uh, you know, 1% of, uh, of the article, and it happens to be on the turn page uh, by the, the birth and death notices, uh, but the 99% the uh, that, that targets him is on the front page of the paper, then that, to me, isn't fair. So you want to look at placement of the story. Um, uh, where where did the plaintiff's version end up? Uh, you know, was it the fourth column down, fourth paragraph down, fifth paragraph down, end of the story, top of the story? You want to look at that. Uh, you're going through uh, the reporter's notes, the reporter's tapes. What did they ignore? What did they leave out? Uh, uh, why'd they leave it out? Especially stuff that's favorable uh, to your client. Uh, draft versions of the story. Uh, you want to know. Uh, um, um, why certain things were pulled out of the story, why th certain things were kept in the story, uh, uh, if draft versions exist in this day of the computer, and, and they often don't, by the way, and that often plaintiff's counsel are incredulous that there's no, no copies of draft versions, and there aren't. There used to be, um, but, but there aren't. Uh, the headlines, by the way, are written by, uh, in fact, you know, I've got to confess, I'm not sure who this nebulous body of headline writers are, but somebody writes headlines totally unrelated to the reporter and the editors that worked on the case. And headlines can, the most carefully crafted of story can be absolutely destroyed by the person who did a headline or did the cut line underneath the photograph uh, uh, um, and what photograph they might have picked indeed of, of your uh, particular client. If I could just interject there, one of the advantages of focusing on headlines is usually they can't uh, attract the fair comment <clears throat> uh, defense. And, and so you really want to look at them. Rick, do you uh, go through the uh, strictures that were set out in the Monroe and Toronto Sun case? Well, the Monroe case, uh, um, uh, reporter basically, not basically, reporter made up a story. Editor didn't check the accuracy of the story. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, 75,000 bucks in generals and punitives uh, were awarded and should have been awarded against uh, the Sun in that case. Uh, uh, Justice Holland uh, uh, spoke of the great power and influence of the media, and uh, uh, you know journalists may, journalists are not uh, uh, well regarded by the public. Uh, they're a notch above us as the legal profession, but not too many notches above us. But we're behind the eight ball. We think, uh, it's my opinion anyway, that uh, when when it comes to defending uh, big media. Uh, I think the courts uh, generally uh, uh, have a problem. Uh, there was a recent Gazette article uh, uh, that's a Law Society Gazette article by one of the justices of this court, uh, uh, which I read, uh, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I read that you know the media are out to sell newspapers and uh, uh, we, they don't necessarily have the public's interest in mind. It was in a fighting non-publication orders, but I think the same thinking can, from time to time applies to media actions. Uh, uh, and in libel actions, they have a great power, and plaintiff's lawyers will effectively play that card. You know, you've got so much power, you the media, you're out to make profit, and, and my poor little guy, uh, to, you know, you hammered him, and you should be hammered by the jury. Well, there's supposed to be a separation of functions between the reporter and the editor. I'm quoting from the decision, it being the responsibility of the editor to confirm the accuracy of the contents of the story before publication. Um, there, there, there always is an editor involved. Uh, I'm not sure, David, that uh, uh, certainly I look to see if that's been done when I'm preparing my clients. I'm not sure in day-to-day -day practice, and I would ask for Carol and Ro uh, Brian's uh, uh, views uh, in day-to-day -day practice whether, because you're putting a newspaper out daily, uh, that that is actually in fact done. Right. Well, I think the Monroe case, the judgment of John Holland, was directed at investigative stories. And uh, that was a targeted story that the Sun had uh, 
to get a number of prominent liberals, including John Monroe. And most of the stories that fill the newspaper every day are not those kinds of stories. They are the factual reporting kinds of stories from the legislature and the municipal council meetings and so on and so on that are, if you look at a newspaper, by far the bulk of what you get. And for those areas, uh, I think there's a recognition, one, that there is some special protection for the newspaper, and two, that there needs to be uh, an ability to, to fix up mistakes if they're made, which gets you into the retraction provisions. So I don't think the Monroe requirement of the separation of functions in quite the way it's set out there is intended to apply beyond the sort of special investigative story where they are really going after somebody. But I think the feature in the Monroe case that I find very useful in, in discoveries is, is that you want to focus on, when you're acting for the plaintiff, whether the, uh, the media gave the person an opportunity to respond to the story. And you should spend considerable time, whether it was a, a phone call at, at uh, uh, 6.15 on a Friday afternoon and just leaving a name, or whether they tried on several occasions and gave some details or whether it was about, or whether they, they called them beforehand, because that is, re is really something that, that uh, His Lordship did, did focus on, and it's a very important feature both uh, legally and uh, and forensically when you're at the trial to show that that somebody was not even given an opportunity to respond to this particular uh, this particular story it really offends everyone's sense of fair play which is really the basis of it which is Rick is talking about now there's two other issues I want Rick to, to, to talk about and then we're going to move to Brian and the first is the question of meaning of the words and I'll give you some context in Ontario uh, so now you can the question uh, the, or the, the Court of Appeal has said in 1910 that you cannot ask questions about the meaning of the, of, of the words, and it, it's the meaning of the words are, the, are an issue for the jury alone. The, a recent decision of the Nova, uh, Nova Scotia Supreme Court and affirmed by the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal allowed the, this particular question, and I'm just going to let Rick talk about it because it, it really is an important uh, important issue. I should ask it one other caveat. This particular decision, uh, the Court of Appeal was uh, rendered at a time when uh, there was no, when discoveries appeared to have been done by way of interrogatory as opposed to the sweeping examination just for discovery that we have today. But that's, that certainly is the, is the law in Ontario. You know, the, the, uh, on meaning of the words, uh, I, I think the law still is that you don't ask a reporter what did they mean uh, by the words, and probably the rationale for that was the, this lesser meaning that David was talking about and Carol were talking about on, uh, in the Turner case where you don't want a reporter to say, well, I didn't mean to, for anyone to interpret that the guy was a lion crook and should be uh, in a thief, et cetera, et cetera, and, and let them defend it that way and mush up the jury's mind. So you're supposed to say, okay, jury, here's the words, here are the sting, here's the sting, and how do you, the jury, as ordinary persons, interpret what those words mean? It doesn't matter what the defendants intended. It's what the people that read it meant. Well, the Nova Scotia Court of Appeals come along, uh, and, and I think they've upheld that rule, but they've said when the issue of malice comes into play, or, the, or even a fair comment defense, or punitive damages, okay, you need to get into the state of the reporter's mind to find out if she, if she in this case was malicious or whether the comment was fair and to do that or, or whether the, the, the uh, reporter should be punished by, by exemplary damages, uh, to do that you have to ask what do you mean by the words? And, and I, I think that melds for the first time I've seen anyway the concept of the meaning of the words and how far can you get into the defendant's state of mind and, and what was intended. Uh, so I, I don't know how it will play here, uh, to be quite honest. Um, you should be aware of it. That it, it is a considerable uh, change. And uh, the last matter Rick is going to deal with is sources and, uh, and how they should be used and what, uh, what questions you can ask and what you can expect to cover. Yeah, we, we have uh, uh, in libel there was a so-called newspaper rule. That is, uh, at the discovery stage of the action, uh, uh, if you, you couldn't get the name of a source, the rationale um, that you don't want libel actions just to be used as a vindictive means of finding out who might have ratted on you or, or, or leaked something to the media, 
um, ancillary to that, of course, is uh, you don't want sources drying up or being scared, and that's a whole other argument that uh, I, don't, I don't think the Supreme Court of Canada has bought into thus far. Um, um, anyway, that, that's the rationale, and it's been upheld notwithstanding the new rules where, you know, you're supposed to give the name and address of witnesses who might have information relevant to the action, and of course a source would in a libel action. Uh, the White case, which you were involved in, David, uh, I, I believe, on the, and it, it, I did note it said, on the facts of this particular case, we're not, in, we're not uh, interpreting Rule 3106 uh, such that we are making uh, the, the media disclose the sources, uh, uh, at least in that case. Uh, optically, I, I, don't, I don't want my reporters to claim source protection. It, it, it's not it's sucking and blowing at the same time for you, the media, to be standing up there saying, uh, I want for the public good to, to be publishing whatever it was that you published about the plaintiff, uh, and, and it's important to have all this out in the open and at the same time keep your cards close to your chest by saying, well, I'm not going to disclose my sources. In other words, hide. Well, that's the antithesis of what openness is all about, and I think optically a plaintiff's counsel can play that card and should go for the jugular. Uh, obviously, you, you insist and you go through whatever you have to go through to get the source uh, 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 named, and, uh, and, and if they refuse, you're going to get it at trial. You're supposed to get it at trial. Not too many journalists, by the way, I think are going to actually go to jail and be in contempt of being ordered to give the name at trial. I don't, think, I, I don't think too many of them really want to do that. Uh, so, of course, the, you put to the jury, well, this is the first time I've learned this. Uh, you know, tell me more about this. You wouldn't tell me before. It looks bad. It doesn't look fair. It's not fair play. So if, if you do have, uh, I mean, there'll be situations where a reporter uh, will want to play hardball and not reveal the source for whatever reason. Um, uh, I think you as plaintiff's counsel can certainly play that, that card quite well before a jury. You know, we, I'm not finished. <laughs> Stop. Just, just let me give you one second. On the Section 2B argument, uh, you know, do, do journalists have source protection flowing from the right to gather news uh, uh, guaranteed by Section 2B of the Charter? And I don't think there's any doubt that Section 2B is both dissemination and gathering. It's in, subsumed in there. Uh, we tried the argument in the Coates case, and the Court of Appeal didn't deal with the issue, uh, although it was claimed they did. It, it was relevancy uh, that they decided. You look at the Moisa case of the Supreme Court of Canada, and I certainly interpret Justice Sapinka's comments as to say uh, he's got some, he at least has some real skepticism about this drying up of sources and the chilling off of uh, sources and the need for this protection. Is that okay? Thank you. Right. Before you, uh, Brian will be talking about uh, uh, about uh, emotions. But before Brian does, I'd like to get Brian's reaction to, to some of the uh, general observations he has about the uh, reaction of, of the media to uh, to libel actions. Sure, I, I think each of us have said in different ways uh, that the most important stretch in a potential libel action is right at the beginning. Certainly from the point of view of the clients I act for, uh, when they get the libel notice, and sometimes on occasion even before, they look very hard at what the situation is, what the complaint is, what the facts are, who the sources are, what the basis is. Under the Ontario Act, you have a three-day period for a daily newspaper to retract. And wherever possible, if, if the uh, newspaper is considering doing that, uh, I try to negotiate the wording of that retraction or apology with the plaintiff's counsel. Sometimes that means you can't do it in the three-day period, but I haven't run into any problems in extending that to permit those kinds of discussions. And, and so something you should appreciate from the point of view of plaintiffs is that this is your main opportunity to, uh, to really get what your client probably really most wants and needs because it shouldn't be, as everybody else has said, a bucket full of cash. That's not going to happen. But what it should be is to get something in the newspaper or on the broadcast ASAP that sets the record straight from their point of view. And because of the way the legislation works in Ontario, there is an incredibly uh, 
short fuse, a, a real onus put on media defendants to look carefully at the libel notice and respond at that point. The fact is, because of that approach, um, that when you get into litigation, when the statement of claim is, uh, is delivered, uh, and some plaintiff lawyers are, are surprised by this, there is a real fight it to death kind of attitude on the part of the media defendants. You've got to remember that, that the media and the reporters are standing behind their story and they've got, they've got their own reputation at, at stake. And so it won't be just a, a, a commercial consideration involved. It, 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 it becomes very personalized and very emotional on, 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 on both sides. And you really have to keep that in mind because you're, you may be entering in a, into a battle that there won't be any opportunity to extricate yourself as in most other types of litigation after discoveries or some other time and, and with uh, a little bit of horse trading. It's yeah, very and similar to professional liability actions in that sense if you do professional liability work with the reputation at stake. Yeah, and, and just, just to come back to the point in advance of that, and that is in that initial period, Rick made this point, but it's very important. Be realistic. You know, you're not going to get anybody to, uh, to fall to their knees and cry on the front page. You're going to get something that under the existing law is what the defendant's counsel think you're entitled to get. And sometimes things can fall apart, not even because of the clients, but because of the lawyers. Instead of being the solvers of the solution, uh, solvers of the problem, they miss the boat uh, because they become too aggressive or try to, to go for something that they just don't really deserve on the law. And as a practical matter, I don't think you should really be conscious about whether you want to get mesmerized by asking for costs or damages, because that can 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 often scuttle something that might have often occurred. And and I've had cases on the defendant side where I've fought the things when they they wanted they wanted uh, just costs, and we've just we've just fought them, and then they walked away with 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 nothing, and they've lost they lost the opportunity for an apology and uh, and uh, right right at the beginning. So. It, it, it is very different from, from other types of litigation. Yeah, and so when we're talking about pleadings, and I've already said when the statement of claim comes across the transom, there is inevitably a different attitude. It is not treated as an ordinary piece of commercial litigation. It is often a, a fight over reputation, not just of your client, of the plaintiff, but also of the defendants. Yeah. And and. Sorry. Well, Brian, you were going to deal with, uh, yeah. uh, with, with pleadings and yeah. uh, sorry, with sorry. motions? Go on to next. So one, one point, uh, once, once you do have a statement of claim to appreciate is, is that libel actions are different in another way as well. And that is, quite rightly, a lot more attention is paid on the pleadings and the scope of the pleadings. Maybe it stems partly from the fact that a defamation action is an action about words, but I think it's largely because of an incredibly delicate balance that is struck in our law, and some of us feel struck on one side of the line rather than the other, between the freedom of speech concerns and the right or the protection for an individual's uh, reputation. It's a delicate balance. It's one that's been struck in our country very differently from some other countries. And for that reason, there are many sort of little checks and balances that are built right into the, the development of the case law. And that starts with the pleadings. The pleadings have already been discussed by David and uh, Carol in some detail. But, but a point to make is that if you allow a statement of claim to stand, that uh, contains material that is extraneous, that's frivolous, that, uh, you know, in other kinds of cases you say, oh, what the hell, you know, we'll let it go. It can cause real problems in a libel case because it can lead to a different scope for discovery. You can get into areas on discovery that would be normally protected at law. And so, generally speaking, as defendant's counsel, we're very careful to try and ensure that the pleadings that emerge, uh, both in terms of the statements of defense and statement of claim, are ones that we can live with through discovery and, and, and at trial. Um, 
and that's why, you know, I think in, in other areas of my practice, I'm pretty relaxed about whether or not we bring motions at the pleading stage, much less relaxed about that when it comes to libel actions. I've had people suggest that this stems from some sort of uh, defense uh, strategy to drag things out, and I can assure you that that's not what it's about. Our, our clients have to pay, too. They've just come through the recession. They don't like taking steps that are unnecessary. Um, I've set out in the materials uh, a whole bunch of grounds for, uh, for motions. I'm not going to, uh, to go through these in any, any detail at all. But there are a couple of things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, just stemming from what I said, when other causes of action are included with an action for libel, and in an action for libel, as I indicated, the courts have created this sort of uneasy balance between freedom of expression and right to reputation. Um, the inclusion of other causes of action can often make that balance very difficult to maintain and can cause real prejudice uh, to defendants. And so that's one area which we look at very carefully. I should say that in non-media type of cases, traditionally, uh, you see a lot of claims for uh, slander and, and libel in wrongful dismissal suits. And traditionally, courts have been reluctant to allow both these causes of action in one piece of litigation. I think that has changed, partly because uh, since 1985, it's no longer a requirement, prima facie requirement, that libel actions be heard by a jury. But uh, that, that's one traditional area you'll see in the case law. Um, one interesting case that illustrates the next point I wanted to make is the decision of uh, Mr. Justice Montgomery last December in the Valor and Horror litigation. This was brought over the CBC documentary, The Valor and the Horror, and a, an accompanying book published by Harper Collins. It was a class action, or started as a representative class action, uh, on behalf of approximately 25,000 uh, living uh, still living airmen from the Second War who served with the Canadian Air Force. And what the defendants did in that case was to bring a Rule 21 motion saying that there is no cause of action here whatsoever. And that motion was heard before the plaintiff even had a chance to start a certification motion. The certification motion was delayed while the Rule 21 motion was dealt with and Mr. Justice Montgomery ruled there was no cause of action. He did that on two bases. One, he said, it's simply not defamatory um, of, of any of the people. Uh, and secondly, it's impossible to have a valid cause of action for libel on behalf of a group of 25,000 people. For libel, and this is a very important thing to keep in mind, libel is a personal action. It dies when you die. And unless you are identifiable personally from the words that were published or spoken, you have no basis for your cause of action. And that is the difficulty that Mr. Justice Montgomery had with the valor and the horror. He could not see how these 25,000 airmen could say they were individually, personally, identifiably defamed by what was broadcast or published. One other point to make, um, there is a special rule, it's a section of libel and slander act, for security for costs in libel cases, which allows the defense to bring the action, bring the motion for security before filing a defense, where he can, the, the defendants can establish uh, that they have a, a good defense to the action and there's good reason to believe that the uh, the plaintiff doesn't have the wherewithal to meet the costs uh, at the end of the day. Um, so that's in addition to what's in the, in the regular rules. Um, I think one other general point to make uh, that comes out of the case law that's related to the one I just made about group libel, and that is that, uh, as in other cases, you can't have an unincorporated association that uh, claims that it's been 
liable. The, the Toronto Teachers Federation, Unincorporated Association of Toronto Teachers, can't sue, in effect, on behalf of Toronto teachers who are members of the association. You have to put forward individuals who have actually been liable. Of course, if there's a corporate entity and you can establish that their reputation has been affected, then you can include them as a party, as the Reichmans did in the uh, litigation against uh, Toronto Life. Um, I think everybody has referred to libel notice, and one thing to keep in mind, and it comes out, of course, when you're considering what motions might be brought, is that there are very tight timelines for bringing libel proceedings against the media. It doesn't apply. In fact, it's a six-year limitation that applies to libel, two years to slander, outside of the media. But for the media, you have to provide a libel notice within six weeks of the libel coming to the attention of the plaintiff, to the knowledge of the plaintiff, and three months to start an action from that original point. And uh, if you fail to meet those, the case law is quite clear, you're in deep trouble as a plaintiff. You'll get your action struck. Uh, one point to keep in mind, sometimes you have served a libel notice about something but decided not to proceed with it. Under the Libel and Slander Act, you have up to a year to include that article uh, or that broadcast with a more recent article or broadcast against the same defendant and include it in a claim as long as you then obey the applicable limitation periods. So uh, it pays to serve a libel notice even if you don't think you're going to proceed with it at that early stage rather than let it slip by. If you're serious about it, if you're concerned about it, serve the libel notice, you can then decide whether or not you're going to proceed with it. Because if you don't and you try and include it, and lots of plaintiffs have done this, I've seen lots of cases, uh, the trial judge will be very, very strict about what use can be made of those previous stories um, which haven't been included and can't be included in the libel action because of the failure to meet the limitation periods. Thank you, Brian. Uh, one, one point from the plaintiff's point of view on, on, on motions. When you're faced with a, a statement of a defense which pleads truth, always get your particulars of justification. It's really critical because they will define the ambit of your documentary disclosure, the ambit of your, uh, of your dis the, the, the discovery of your client at uh, their, their discovery, and also the evidence that can be introduced at trial. So it's really critical not to allow what we call bald pleas of justification just to s sort of sit and simmer on the record there. You've got to get your particulars. Now, uh, that brings us to the end, and it gives us about a minute and a half from, for questions. So uh, I'd like to open the floor if anyone has any, uh, has any questions. Can yes, sir? Tell us again why that case was dismissed at the commencement of the trial a few weeks ago? Oh, the, uh, <coughs> the... This week? This week. It was just... Yeah, it was this week. Yeah. The pleading set out false innuendos. And the defense took the position that the words of which the plaintiff complained, and he just set out particular words that were in the article, not the entire article. He pleaded that the words that were complained of didn't, weren't capable of bearing that meaning. And at the open of trial, a motion was brought by the defense for the judge to rule on whether the words complained of, i.e. the particular parts set out in the statement of claim, bore the actual meanings alleged in the statement of claim, like the false innuendos. And, um, the ruling was that the words were not capable of bearing the particular meaning set out. The action was dismissed, but with leave to amend the statement of claim within 15 days. Yes. Yes. It, it can be determined on a, on a preliminary summary motion. But it, it, it's often, they're often reluctant do that because then the court's usurping the role of the, of the, of the jury. They've got two questions, whether it's capable of, which is a question of law, which uh, and then whether it is, 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 is a question of fact, but, but in reality, they don't, the judges don't want to take it away from the jury. 
That's right, and it's difficult, too, because you don't have to justify the expense of bringing a motion, which the court may decline to rule on and say, we'll leave it to the trial judge, so. Under a rule of 21 motion. Rule 21. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no reason why the motion couldn't be brought as a pretrial application because it is a pure legal ruling. But there's one point, David, I think I should, we should make before we leave, and that is, if, if there are no questions, and that is that uh, uh, in the area of damages, where you're acting for someone who is claiming that their reputation and business has been harmed, or if they're a professional, that their professional reputation and practice has been harmed, but not pleading specific damages, special damages. They can still have their uh, financial records opened on discovery because the question, and, and Mr. Justice Anderson decided this in the Reichman case with respect to Olympia and York financial information, which at that point of time was, was a state secret, um, that, uh, that this has a bearing on what kind of general damages are obtainable. If in fact a lawyer who claims he's been horrifically injured by the publication hasn't suffered a bump or much more than a bump in his practice, um, then that belies the claim for a large general damage sum um, at trial. Any other questions? Thank you. Move on to the uh, next. Hamilton, he's been a member of the bar for 17 years and he practices with the firm of Ross and McBride, practicing in litigation. He just completed a libel trial that lasted for about a month and I think he's going to be referring to that. His topic is on evidentiary issues in a libel action and he has completed a paper which is included in your materials. I'd like to welcome Mr. Ivey. Thank you. The speakers on the panel immediately before me, as you heard, represent people like the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail. Uh, I tend to represent people whose names are Bob and Mary and Mario and that sort of thing. And I think from a primarily plaintiff's perspective, the, uh, those of you who act for plaintiffs will find that you are being approached by uh, people like that who are either uh, angry at their employer or at their neighbor and sometimes at the media. The previous speaker spoke to you uh, about the discovery process and what perhaps to some extent was left unsaid in their remarks is the cost that can be involved in a plaintiff launching a defamation action, uh, no matter who the potential defendant may be, and the balancing of the cost of that litigation against the uh, hoped for recovery, which is often, in fact, something far less than what the plaintiff indeed believes uh, has been done to his or her reputation. Uh, the case that I was involved in and, and that I believe raises uh, and did raise a, a number of evidentiary issues, which was the topic assigned to me today, uh, was very much a case like that. The plaintiff uh, worked for a government agency. The defendant uh, was a separate uh, corporate entity uh, fully funded by the government agency for which the plaintiff was employed. Uh, my client, uh, the, um, the separate entity, had been having problems in its dealings with the plaintiff and had complained uh, from time to time uh, to the government department about her, uh, asking the department to do something about her and uh, her relationship with them. Uh, finally, uh, and, and I stress this was before I became involved, the government said to my client, uh, please put your concerns into writing. And uh, thus the tale began to unfold because my client, uh, quite unfortunately as it turned out, uh, took to heart that request. 
and I, I just want to read you a couple of extracts from the, the written material that was then delivered by my client um, to the government. The cover letter sent by the executive director described the plaintiff as being uncooperative, arrogant, dogmatic, belligerent, um, and working energetically to disrupt the activities of my client. Attached to the cover letter were specific letters that had been, or memos that had been provided by staff who had had more of a hands-on working relationship with the plaintiff. Uh, one of those staff members uh, described the plaintiff's conduct as uh, rudeness, aggression, arrogance, uh, inconsideration, vindictiveness, went on to describe her actions as generated by her insensitivity and castrative management techniques. A, uh, having said that, um, he went on to say, and he was a very articulate witness, I should tell you, he went on to say uh, in conclusion that uh, retribution would one way or another be exacted against those who complained uh, about the plaintiff's actions. He stated, so the catch-22 syndrome is in effect and more or less ensures that the plaintiff can continue her sadistic activities with little interference. Uh, the other author uh, chose to use less colorful language such as inhumane and insensitive and unethical and spiteful, but you certainly get the picture that uh, my client was not particularly enamored by the uh, plaintiff's actions. Uh, what my client at the time didn't uh, understand was that pretty soon after the government received those letters, they put them into the hands of the plaintiff and it wasn't too long after that that the letters started coming from the plaintiff's counsel. Uh, briefly, what transpired thereafter was that uh, the plaintiff was removed from dealings with my client, uh, developed a very poor relationship with her immediate superior, who uh, she felt was in cahoots with my client. There, relationship uh, degenerated to the point where she was uh, suspended from work under the, um, the, the federal legislation where the government tried to terminate her employment. Uh, she was reinstated. Uh, her relationship, as you might expect, with her uh, superior continued to deteriorate. And ultimately, uh, her, she did not progress, uh, as you might expect, in her employment. So she sued my client alleging both damage to her reputation uh, in general damage terms and as well claimed a loss of income on the basis that had my client not said these things about her, she would have be, uh, been able to progress through the government system and would have been earning much more money uh, than she was. The action uh, uh, jury notice was served uh, by the plaintiff. The defendant uh, despite the colorful language that you heard, uh, elected uh, to plead both justification and qualified privilege. The issues, the evidentiary issues which arose out of that and that became difficult, I think, for everyone to work with during the trial was to assess the evidence that was being called and determining whether any of it could properly be objected to by the plaintiff. The plaintiff's case, as you might expect with that language, was relatively straightforward. Uh, she gave her own evidence that uh, she had been a wonderful employee and had been damaged by these words. She called uh, associates, uh, none of whom uh, were uh, present day associates, but nevertheless working associates who gave evidence to corroborate her good reputation. Uh, and she called certain um, uh, people who were on parole, the, this being in the, in the field of probation and parole, uh, certain um, criminal clientele who were on parole who said what a wonderful uh, parole officer she was. Uh, one of the, um, as, as you go through these lengthy trials, there, there are moments that uh, at least everybody can enjoy, and one of them was that a witness she called was the head of the um, Hamilton uh, Special Investigation Unit or some such thing, and the officer uh, was giving evidence of uh, how closely this uh, 
police depart police uh, unit worked with the probationary uh, uh, entities in Hamilton and how they always knew what was going on. So the officer was, of course, asked when he first became aware of the fact that this lawsuit was underway or indeed that my client had written the letters. And it turned out to be about a week before the trial. And I, and I don't think that necessarily helped either on the one hand the Hamilton police force or on the other hand the plaintiff's suggestion that the whole community uh, had become aware of these comments made by the defendant. The the difficulty, as I say, that I think primarily the plaintiff faced was in terms of the evidence that the defendant intended to call. The plaintiff had been employed by this government agency for about six or seven years prior to the delivery of the letters and had continued to be employed by that agency for another six or seven years approximately after the delivery of the letters. So that in, in pleading a combination of justification and qualified privilege, the plaintiff was in the difficult spot of having the defendant tendering evidence that, strictly speaking, was hearsay, as well as calling evidence of, uh, in, the, in the pure viva voce sense of the defendant's own knowledge and own experiences with the plaintiff that went to why the defendants chose to use the words that they used in those letters that I referred you to. And as the trial uh, proceeded and, and the witnesses uh, one after the other were called, there were constant objections being made by the plaintiff uh, to the evidence that we were putting forward, uh, usually on a hearsay or relevancy basis. What we tried to do as the defense, however, was to establish, first of all, that the plaintiff had a very poor reputation within what in, at trial was referred to as the correctional community up to the time of the letter, and that indeed, in the time period subsequent to the letter, her reputation was no different. Apart from trying to demonstrate that, the defendant had to provide evidence that showed uh, either the truthfulness of the statements made or the basis upon which the defendants were able to say that they had an honest belief as to the words used. And the way that evidence was called was to call people who knew the plaintiff in both of the periods of time that straddled the letters <coughs> and of course to call the defendants themselves to offer evidence of not only the individual experiences that all of these people had at different times in acting uh, either as co-employees of the plaintiff or acting in a relationship similar to my clients, but also uh, to call evidence of what those people knew of her reputation from others within this group that we came to define as the correctional community. Uh, that community being made up of parole officers, of uh, agencies such as my client, of uh, parolees who had to deal not only with her but with other kinds of parole officers, the police department and the like. So as I say, the, the, the fact of that defense being used led to a great deal of evidentiary difficulty and really, <coughs> and again, I although I keep saying the difficulties for the plaintiff, I again say I was the defendant. The difficulty the plaintiff had was in trying to keep out evidence that he couldn't properly cross-examine on in, in the classical sense, and yet being met by these defenses that really do permit the plaintiff, or the defendant rather, to lead evidence that, strictly speaking, would be hearsay in most other actions that you would deal with. The third issue, of course, in the trial, uh, apart from the two defenses that I, I mentioned, uh, was the question of damages. And in this case, where the plaintiff had elected to argue that her employment uh, future with uh, her employer had been damaged by these statements, the evidence that the defendant wanted to call to show that she didn't have much of a reputation even before the delivery of the letters uh, was necessary in order to try to minimize the damages to which the plaintiff uh, 
uh, would argue that she was entitled. In the Korach case, uh, a decision of the Court of Appeal, which is uh, referred to in the material, the issue there had been a school principal writing a critique on a part-time teacher, the critique being written to his uh, superior. And the issue uh, on appeal was whether the trial judge had been correct in refusing to permit the defendant to call evidence of what other people had told the principal about the plaintiff's actions, evidence that, of course, would normally be seen as hearsay. The Court of Appeal found that the, judge had, the trial judge had misunderstood the test of what constitutes honest belief and had erred in not permitting the defendant to give that evidence of, again, what others had told him. In our case, the trial judge did not err in that sense. He, he freely, as the decisions, uh, the, the particular decisions went, permitted the defendant to call evidence as to what others had said or uh, to my particular clients or even to some of the other witnesses. And, and again, I, I just raise with you the, the difficulty that poses for a plaintiff met by that defense. The other aspect, <coughs> excuse me, of of that kind of evidence and that kind of claim is the length of time it takes to deal with an action of that sort. Uh, there were some 30 odd witnesses ultimately called at the trial and I tell you that that was scaled down uh, by the fourth week when everyone was running out of energy to call more witnesses to again offer their opinions that the words used by the defendants, in fact, accurately described the plaintiff. The, because of the employment connection, and, and this wouldn't arise, of course, in every case, but because of the employment connection, uh, there were literally hundreds of documents that also had to be gone through, particularly to try to demonstrate to the court or to the jury that the nature of the plaintiff was such that the chance of her progressing in any meaningful way through the hierarchy of the government department was going to be close to nil. And, and to try to demonstrate that, uh, her employment documentation was produced, uh, not by the plaintiff, as I'll refer to in a moment, but by subpoena, and ultimately showed the number of grievances and complaints and sexual harassment charges and such that the plaintiff herself had initiated over time that had seemingly nothing to do with what uh, the defendants had done, but certainly was called to show to the jury that uh, her damage, at least in the uh, out-of-pocket income sense, was pretty close to nil. In dealing with these evidentiary issues that came up, the trial judge uh, had a difficult time. As I say, I think uh, the defendant ultimately was successful, certainly in the majority of the evidence that it wished to put forward. The judge uh, indicated uh, at different times during the trial that he would have to consider either striking the jury if he thought it would be too difficult for the jury to assess what evidence went to what point. Uh, and I, let me digress there. The, the statements that my clients made were made in, uh, at a particular point in time, and it was important to be able to prove that at that point in time, there was an honest belief in the accuracy of those statements, or indeed that those statements were true. The evidence that was called of events that took place after that point in time was primarily called with respect to the issue of damages because of how her employment history unfolded. But her employment history after the letters also reflected on the kind of person that she was and would feed back into the issues of justification or the issue of honest belief. And it would be very difficult for a jury to say, well, all right, I'm going to listen to that evidence only on this point and evidence up to the, the date of the letters on the other point. And the judge 
told us, as I said a moment ago, that he would have to consider uh, dismissing the jury if he felt it was too confusing, or alternatively would have to give them a very carefully worded charge. What ultimately happened uh, was that he did not discharge the jury, and he didn't give them a carefully worded charge. Uh, in the material in your binder, there is a, 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 a copy of a um, standard jury charge. It, it comes from uh, Mr. Porter's book on uh, Canadian libel practice, uh, and that charge, as, as um, I, I heard from the trial judge, was basically read to the jury as is without the jury being instructed on those issues. Now again, I felt in that case that only could have helped the defense in terms of uh, not bringing to the jury's attention that it should disregard some of the evidence for some purposes. The part of the, the point in, in the telling of those issues is that as a plaintiff, I think you, you must take great care in deciding whether or not the issue is one that your client can afford and <coughs> uh, whether the damages are going to be economic even if you think your client is likely going to be successful. A second issue uh, evidentiary that arose in the trial and, and which I make reference to in my paper is that in defamation actions unlike uh, most uh, civil actions, the defendant is allowed to move a motion of non-suit at the conclusion of the plaintiff's case without being required to make an election as to whether the defendant intends to call evidence. In a situation where the defense is qualified privilege and where the defendant therefore has only to show an honest belief in the word spoken, it puts an additional onus on the plaintiff to ensure that in the plaintiff's own case there is sufficient evidence to allow the plaintiff to succeed on or in the face of that motion. The, def the plaintiff cannot hope therefore to establish its case through cross-examination of the defendant witnesses because it may not get that far. Uh, in the materials which I've given you uh, you will see the, um, I think, what are the three or four uh, leading cases, oft-quoted cases, in dealing with th this right of a uh, defendant to bring a motion of that nature without the um, uh, being put to the normal election. On the evidence in this case, uh, I think the trial judge uh, had a great deal of difficulty. The case law indicates that the judge uh, should only permit the issue to go to the jury where the, he is or she is of the opinion that there is a substantial chance that the plaintiff will succeed. The only evidence uh, in terms of the witnesses before the court that he felt he could rely on was one witness who had said that one of the defendants had said to her that the defendant was going to get the plaintiff. Uh, there was no other evidence which suggested malice on the part of the defendants other than that comment and that particular witness had been one who had been fired by the defendant some number of years prior to the trial. I think it would have been very, if, if that was the only thing the plaintiff could have argued, I think the plaintiff would have had great difficulty in getting past the motion. What the plaintiff argued, however, was that the intrinsic evidence, that is the words that the defendant used in the memo was, were themselves so strong that it was evidence of malice uh, in and of itself. And that was largely the basis on which the trial judge dismissed the motion for the non-suit and the trial continued. The, what the trial judge did, however, was that in reviewing the words uh, that I referred you to, and there, and there were many more. There were there were a number of other letters also that comprised the package, uh, the other words not being so strong. Uh, the trial judge, in effect, dismissed the action with respect to all of the words used by the defendants, but for four. And the defendant's case, therefore, became one of trying to justify 
uh, unethical, uh, sadistic, inhumane, and um, castrative. The, because the uh, executive director of my client had not chosen to use those particular words in the cover letter that had conveyed the other letters to the government, the action against him, in fact, was dismissed uh, on the motion for non-suit. So beware of that as a plaintiff faced uh, by a defense of qualified privilege. Another issue that arose in this action that uh, does not arise often, I don't think, is one where you learn that the plaintiff, uh, while supposedly producing documents prior to trial, is in fact trying to get documents destroyed prior to trial. The plaintiff, um, uh, plaintiff's counsel, in response to the normal request for the production of the employment file, uh, produced to us a package that was made up of 25 or 35 pieces of paper. And, and, uh, and I please don't in anything I say here read any criticism of plaintiff's counsel. Uh, they sent me the whole package as they got it from the government. One of the enclosed letters, however, uh, referred to an application which the plaintiff had made through the privacy provisions uh, applicable to the federal government employees to have portions of her employment file destroyed. On a subsequent continuation of the examination for discovery, uh, the plaintiff purported not to know what documents had been destroyed or if indeed any had been destroyed, and also admitted to having received other documents herself from the government which she no longer had in her possession. At trial, the plaintiff admitted in cross-examination that she had indeed initiated this procedure to have portions of her employment file destroyed at a time when she also acknowledged knowing that she had an obligation to produce documents. There is a rule in, in the rules of civil procedure that permit the judge to make such order as he feels appropriate. Uh, at the conclusion of the plaintiff's evidence, uh, her own personal evidence, a motion was brought to have the action dismissed uh, for that failure. The trial judge chose not to uh, but nevertheless ultimately penalized her to some extent in respect of costs because of that action. I, I got the signal that my time is up. I just want to refer uh, you, if I might briefly, uh, in the end of my paper, although it doesn't strictly deal with evidence, I have brought uh, to your attention the recent House of Lords decision in spring that uh, the earlier panel also referred you to. Uh, spring is a, is a very interesting decision dealing with how counsel might argue negligence to avoid a claim based on defamation where qualified privilege might exist. Uh, what happened in spring was that the plaintiff uh, had been working, this is an English case, had been working for an insurance company and sought employment with another insurance company. Under some rules governing insurance companies, there was an obligation on the prior employer to provide a letter of reference. The letter of reference, as the trial judge uh, summarized, that was the kiss of death to the plaintiff's opportunity of obtaining that subsequent employment. And he sued the uh, employer based on both defamation and on negligence. With respect to the defamation action, the court, uh, the, the court of appeal, that it, and as well the House of Lords, found the defense of qualified privilege to exist found that the writers or, or the, the people who had supplied information to the writer to provide the letter of reference had been negligent, but that negligence in itself was not malice, and therefore the defense of qualified uh, privilege exists. Uh, Korach also deals with that issue and also stands for the proposition that negligence is not equivalent to malice. What the House of Lords did, which the, court, the English Court of Appeal did not do, however, was it found that there ought to be, as a matter of policy, an extension of Headley Byrne to a case such as this so that the plaintiff could sue on the principles of negligence and not be defeated by a claim of qualified privilege. The trial judge having found that there was negligence in the preparation of the report, or the letter of reference, the uh, court found that the plaintiff, subject to issue of causation, 
which resulted in the matter going back to the Court of Appeal, but subject to the, that issue, uh, the Court of Appeal decided that this was an appropriate policy extension of the grounds of negligence. Now that case dealt with a letter of reference, but it is, as uh, the earlier panel indicated, certainly something to consider in other aspects where if you can establish that there ought to be a duty of care owed by the author of the writing to the recipient of the writing, might that give your client an, uh, an argument that negligence ought to be the basis for your claim? And in that case, you don't have to meet uh, honest belief, which is in general terms at least a very difficult onus to overcome for plaintiffs. I hope that was useful. My time is well up. Thank you.